but it fits so well. So we are in Ruth, but we're not going to. But it's Christmas time. We're supposed to be finishing up the book of Ruth today. But let me begin by reading Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Come on. Luke chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirius, the governor of Syria, all returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was the descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guiding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. It's Christmas time, and yet we're supposed to be finishing up Ruth. But the two really are not that dissimilar. They're very connected. The book of Ruth is all about a woman who's been devastated. We remember, as we, if you've been following us along, in those first five verses, her life is just decimated by personal tragedies, by circumstantial tra- tragedies. And at the end of chapter 1, verse 5, we have sympathy for this woman who's lost everything. The question's for God. What are you up to? And the basic book of question of the book of Ruth was, will God be faithful? Will he keep his promises? Will he maintain his faithful, steadfast love and fulfill his promises to Naomi? Well, as we looked at the book, we found that he did. Through a man named Ruth, excuse me, a man named Boaz and, and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. God orchestrated things so that Naomi was taken care of. But the end of the story ends in the genealogy. If you want to look at Ruth, I'll read it to you. If not, I'll just read it. We're just That's all we're going to be in Ruth. Just, I just want you to read this ge- genealogy. This is how the book of Ruth ends. This wonderful love story between a man and a woman and a baby being born ends like this. This is the genealogical record of their ancestor, Perez. Perez was the father of Herzon. Herzon was the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. And Boaz was the father of Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. And if, if you're like me at one point in my life, I read these, these genealogies and went, what's the point? Well, the point is, is this, this author at the end of the book suddenly takes this wonderful story and he deliberately tells us, you need to think about this story in terms of the whole plot line of the Bible. 
Because this connects what's going on here to every all the promises that have been happening in the book of Genesis, starting in the Garden of Eden. This whole plot line of the Bible it has to do with the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. Which gets us to Luke, where the final resolution that's being hinted at here in Ruth really gets its resolution in Christmas. I mean, it's nice that Ruth gets a new husband, but is that really a compensation for losing your own, your first one? No. I mean, what would really compensate you is give, give him back. <laughs> well, Christmas does that. Ultimately, it does. There's the re here's the resolution. And let, as, as I go forward, let, let me see if you can see what I'm talking about. We come to the shepherds. The shepherds in Luke chapter 2. You see, they're waiting for a baby too. Just like we were waiting for a baby in the book of Luke. Excuse me, in the book of Ruth. In the book of, of Luke, though, these shepherds have been waiting a long time. I hate to wait. Does anybody hate wait, like to wait? Oh. Man, I go to the grocery store and I search for the shortest line. And more than short, the short, shortest line, I try to find which one of the cash registers are moving the fastest. Because 30 seconds matters. <sighs> Ask my wife. I'm impatient. Aren't I, honey? Yes, I am. God's done a work in my life. I'm getting better. But, but I don't like to wait. And I really don't like to wait when someone's promised me that they're going to be on time and that they don't show. Isn't that really frustrating? Well, these shepherds in Luke chapter 2 have been waiting a long time. And not just for a couple of hours, not even a couple of days or even years. They've been literally waiting for a thousand, two thousand years for God to keep the promise. The first time God made a promise that they are looking forward to begins in actually Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, just to give you the context, it's the beginning of the whole Bible, and God has set everything up, he's created everything, and in that chapter, over and over, he tells us that he is good. He's the good God who is always taking care of his people. Seven times in just the first chapter we read that God, that God does what's good. Well, to this very good God, he has created people, he's put them in this wonderful place where every need is met. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, socially, it is a perfect place. And we rebel. We say, no, God, we don't think you know what you're doing. In chapter 3. And in the midst of God describing what's going to happen because of that, he makes a promise that somebody's coming. Genesis chapter 3 reads like this. Do you want to turn to it? I'm going to go to a lot of different verses, so I don't, I, you don't necessarily need to read them all, but we're going to be zipping through the Bible today. But in Genesis chapter 3, it, it declares that there is somebody coming who will crush the serpent's head, and it reads like this. This is God speaking to the serpent who caused this whole mess. He says, and I will cause hostility between you, serpent, and the woman, between her offspring and your offspring, and he will strike your head, and you, no, you will strike his head, and he will strike your heel. Wow, boy, I'm struggling with that verse. Let me reread it. I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. There's somebody coming. And the point is, is somebody's coming who's going to deal with this mess. In the midst of Adam and Eve, our forefathers, reeling in despair over what mess they've caused. It's, the, it's everything that's bad in our world starts in Genesis 3. All of it, from cancer to racism to bigotry, death. Cancer, addictions, it all starts right here. 
And God says, in the midst of you reeling from the fact that this is going to be all caused by your actions, he gives a, a promise. Somebody's coming. He's going to fix all this. And so Adam and Eve has hope. Somebody's going to come and deal with this. And so they have some children. And they think, maybe these two will solve the problem. But if you know the story of Cain and Abel, it doesn't work out so well. Cain kills Abel. Instead of solving the problem, it actually gets worse. You have murder. I mean, we're, we're not even into the fifth chapter of the Bible, and you have murder. Brother to brother. Well, after that, baby after baby gets born. And the world gets darker and darker and darker. As we start moving through the Bible, Genesis chapter 3 and 4 and 5, and you just see this huge list of baby after baby after baby getting born, and the world just gets darker and darker and darker. And the promised one doesn't come that Adam and Eve have been waiting for. Well, you get to a guy named Noah, and although he's not the guy who solves it, you look at what his story is, and you get a sense of what this baby is going to do, this person who's coming. He's going to provide a way to deliver the people who trust in God's provision from the consequences of their sin. But Adam doesn't, uh, Noah doesn't solve the problem. Because after Noah, people start doing the same thing all over again. They still sin. The world gets darker and darker, and baby after baby is born, and the promised one doesn't come. And so you get to this guy named Abraham, and you think, well, here's a little different. For the first time in the Bible, as you're reading it through, somebody is called back to the land. They've been kicked out of it because of their sin in Genesis 3, but Abraham's brought back. And you think, okay, well, maybe this is a little different. And Abraham clearly is a unique guy. And God makes a promise to him. In Genesis 12, it reads like this. The Lord God said to Abram, Go to the land I will show you, and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you, to your offspring, to your child, I will give the land. And that's basically saying two things. One, I'm giving you back the land. It's, a, it's, it's referring back to the promise of Eve. That they're going to get back to chapter 2, where everything was perfect. And that through one of Abram's children... Everybody's going to get blessed. And so you think, okay, good. Finally, the world's gotten darker. A lot of babies have been born, but not the baby. And so you start looking as you're reading the story. Oh, no. Finally, the baby's going to get here. Good. And so you hear about Isaac, a unique birth. And the, the, the anticipation is high, finally. But unfortunately, Isaac is really only known for one guy, one thing. Almost being a sacrifice. Not being the one. So you read in Genesis 22 that, that at the last moment God says, No, Abram, he's not the one. I will provide it. And so Abraham steps off the stage. And the promise that went from Eve to Abraham now moves forward. And it's passed on to Isaac. And Isaac, it reads like this in Genesis 26. For to you and to your descendant, your child, I will give the land, and I will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. So the promise goes from Abraham to Isaac, and then from Isaac to one of his children, Jacob. Genesis 28, I am the Lord your God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and I will give to you, you and your descendant the land. So now we get... To Jacob. And then from Jacob, it moves on to one of Jacob's sons, Judah, in Genesis 49, which reads like this. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. And so we get to the end of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and what we have seen is this. Baby after baby keeps getting born... The world gets darker and darker, more sinful, more bad, and God keeps promising over and over. We know he's going to be the child of Eve. We know he's going to be a son of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah. And he's going to be a king like no other. He's going to rescue people from their sin. because We see that in Noah. 
but he hasn't come. So you turn the page and you start reading Exodus. And you read about a baby and you think, wow, finally a baby's going to come. He's a special baby. But he's not the right baby. Because this guy named Moses is, has the wrong father. His father was Levi. He's, he's from Levi, one of Judah's brothers. So it can't be the right guy. But before Moses steps off the stage, he gives us an amazing picture of what this coming baby is going to do. We see that in the book of Exodus, through the Exodus. In the Exodus, this where God takes his people out of Egypt and brings them back to the land to worship him is one of the most graphic ways of describing what this baby will do. Taking them out of slavery, out of captivity, bringing them back into the land where they can worship God, giving them a new covenant, a new re relationship with God. Good, but where's this baby? Well, before Moses steps off the stage, he reaffirms that someone's coming. In Deuteronomy verse chapter 18, and he says, Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers, and you need to listen to him. So when Moses leaves, he says, there's still somebody coming, and he's going to speak for God. Well, where's this baby? You see, baby after baby keeps getting born. The world gets darker and darker and more messed up, but this promised one doesn't come. When will he get here? Well, we get to the next book, and we see this guy named Joshua. Now, Joshua's a pretty good guy. He takes God's people and he puts them back into the land where they belong. But Joshua isn't the guy. Oh, oh, he tells us some more about him. You see, they don't know it, but th those of us who know the New Testament realize that we even know the name of this baby at this point. Because Joshua, in Greek, is Jesus. The Lord saves. But they don't know that at this point. But Joshua brings them into the promised land, and it, for a moment it looks like, well, it might be okay. But then you move into the next book after Joshua passes on, and the book of Judges is one of the most horrific books in the entire Bible. The sins they do there would not get a rated R rating in a movie. It would be rated X. It's that bad. Some of these things are horrible. It's, a, it's the fall all over again. See, baby after baby keeps getting born, and the world gets more and more dark and more evil, but the baby doesn't come. When will he get here? And that's where the book of Ruth comes in, that God is saying in, this, in the midst of that very dark time, I'm still going to be faithful. He's coming. I'm, I'm going to make sure that my promise will get fulfilled. So we get to this guy named David, which we read in Ruth. And David's a special guy. He's really good for a king. And for the very first time since Judah, God reaffirms his promise that somebody's coming. He narrows it down. He's been narrowing it from all people, Eve, to Abraham, to Isaac, to, Ju to Jacob, to Judah. And now he says, it's going to come from one of your sons, David, in 2 Samuel it reads like this. This is God talking to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers when you're dead, I will raise up from, for you one of your children after you and I will establish his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, he to me a son. So what we see in this one is that once again God's going to bring a special person into the world through David and he's going to have a kingdom which connects us to Judah and all of those promises. But the difference here is he's going to be like a father-son thing, which reminds us of the story of Isaac, where God says, he, I will provide the child. So we get to David, and we think, finally, I mean, we're a good portion into the Bible at this point. Finally, this baby's going to come. The world's gotten darker and darker. Baby after baby's been born. Finally, this kid's going to get here. And so we start looking at his kids. And we see this guy named Solomon. Now, Solomon starts pretty good. But he doesn't end good. And then king after king comes. Child after child of David comes. And we're not back to Genesis 2. The world just gets darker and darker and darker. 
baby after baby gets born, and the promised one doesn't come. Who will this baby get? They've been waiting at least a thousand years at this point. And God just seems to keep promising, but doesn't do anything. Well, instead of God just saying, okay, I've promised enough, you just need to wait. He does the opposite. At this point in the story, God starts promising like gangbusters to things through the prophets. And the, and the information we get about what he's going to be just explodes. From people like Isaiah, we hear that he's going to be born of a virgin. From Micah, he'll be born in the town of Bethlehem. From Ezekiel, he'll be a shepherd to his people. From Isaiah 35, he'll make the blind see. He'll make the deaf hear, the lame leap, the mute speak. We hear in the Psalms, he'll be a king like no other, rescuing us from oppressors. He'll have a righteous salvation from, from Zechariah. He'll bear our sin. Isaiah 53, he'll set us free from captivity and darkness. God just keeps promising over and over and over, and the world just keeps getting darker. And at this point, it's so dark that God's people have to be kicked back out of the land again because they're so bad. It's the fall all over again. Baby after baby gets born. The world gets darker and darker. If this baby just doesn't come. Will God keep his promise? Well, that brings us to the shepherd. God's been silent for 400 years. And they're sitting there on a Roman captivity, and they're, they, they, at least some of them had to be thinking, I think God's probably forgotten us, if he even was there to begin with. He certainly doesn't seem to be keeping his promise. Well, they're out at night on the night shift, doing their normal daily life, and suddenly, the sky light up with a display that's never been seen in all of history. And the angels say, it's finally happened. The baby has finally come. Glory to God in the highest. Today in Bethlehem is born the one you've been waiting for. God is not a man that he should lie to us. Nor a son a man that he should change his mind. When God promises, he fulfills it. If he speaks, he always acts. And he'll keep his promises to you. Always. What does this have to do with Ruth? What's the connection? You see, the problem with Ruth is not just that she has lost her husband. It's a world that's screwed up. And they need rescuing. They need a bigger solution than Boaz can ever provide. Don't we? I mean, too many times we think a husband or a wife or more money will solve our problems. It won't. We need a deliverer who, who, who solve the screwed up world we live in. Christmas is God's answer. That's the answer. And so when it ends in a genealogy in Ruth, he's saying, this has been an example for you that God is faithful. And we can see that in the text in a small sense. He provides an amazing guy named Ruth, a woman named Ruth, an amazing guy named Boaz. Yes, they're good examples for us, but the book is not about examples of how to live a Christian life. It's that God is good and faithful. And he'll be faithful to you and me. We need a deliverer. We need a deliverer. We need to get back to the garden. Back where everything is right again. With each other, in our own heads, with God. And we have tried everything else. Humanity has tried everything to get it right. It doesn't work. The only thing that does is God providing this guy named Jesus. That's it. And he will do that for you. And you say, well, 
God's not keeping his promise. We'll listen to our brother Peter and what he says. Above all, brothers and sisters, you need to understand that in these last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing and following their own evil desires. And saying, where is this coming again that Jesus said he was going to do? Ever since our fathers, our ancestors died, everything goes on like it's always gone on. But don't forget this one thing, my dear friends, with the Lord at A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. God is not slow in keeping his promise. He will keep it. But the day of the Lord will come. And it will burn up the heavens. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Everyone will know exactly what it is. You can't hide from God. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives looking forward to the day of God. In keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heavens, a new earth, the home of righteousness, back to Genesis 2, where we can live rightly again, and so make every effort to be pleasing to him. See, that, that, that's what we need to do. So if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, do so. He is the answer. Christmas is the answer. It's not a Boaz. It's not money. It's not sex. It's not drugs. God is. That's it. And that's what Christmas And Christmas says that all these promises he's ever made to you, he will keep them. He made thousands of them, and he's keeping every last one of them. And so, even though, as we live this life, it seems like baby after baby gets born, the world gets darker and darker and darker, and we're longing for God to keep his promise, remember Christmas. He always keeps his promise. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you keep your promise. We are grateful that you have not abandoned us. Sometimes we feel like we're just abandoned by you. But that's not true. Sometimes we think that you don't care what's happening. But you came from heaven to seek us. Jesus, you are the humble king who's come to the broken because you knew we needed you. And we have tried everything to be right with you, and it just doesn't work. And so, Jesus, as we come before you, help us to lay our hearts before you as the three kings came and laid their lives, their, their treasures. Lay it, may we lay the treasure of our heart at your feet. And trust in your promise, the promise that you'll forgive us, the promise that you will make us fit for heaven, the promise that you will come again and bring us to be with you. That You will never turn away those who come to you in faith. Let us be steadfast in trusting your promises. May Christmas remind us that you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.